This is Brian Putt. Today I'd like to talk to you about calculating the critical path in a network of systems. I looked on YouTube and I didn't see anything that talked about calculating critical paths in a probabilistic model, in a probabilistic network. Today I want to show you how to do that using SIP math and simulation. Let's assume we have five tasks, A, B, C, D, and E. And they are connected as shown here. Task B uh, follows task A, as does task C follow task A. Task D requires task B and C to both be completed. And task E requires B and D to be completed. We've assessed a range for each one of these activities. Task A has a mean, most excuse me, most likely of six, with a minimum of three and a maximum of nine. And you can see the other parameters here as well. Let's talk about the critical path when all the values are at their most likely. In this model, I have a variable called sensitivity it can take on four different values. If it's a zero, it uses a sample time. A one is a mean, two is most likely, and three is max. And as you can see, I've set it to two, the most likely value. As a result, the time used for each of these tasks is equal to the most likely values over here. Task A starts at time zero and lasts for six, six units. Let's call these uh, days. So six days. Task B starts at the end of task A and requires 11, so it finishes at 17. Task C starts at the completion of task A. Task D starts at the maximum of task B and C. And task E starts at the maximum of task B and D. So task E completes after 22 days. What is the critical path in this particular simulation, this particular iteration, if you will, trial? Well, how can we determine that? Well, let's think about it. If one of these tasks was shortened by just a little bit, let's call it epsilon, would this time change? So let me put in an epsilon here, and let's see what changes. So I'll put in a 0.01 here, and we can see that this went down by 1. Let's copy that over to this epsilon, that kind of coding. And we'll put this back to 0. Do the same here. Let's stop here. What happened? The first two went down by 0.01, and this, in, this one didn't change. When I reduced the, the time for task C, it didn't change. Let's record that. So what have we learned? Using the most likely values here all the time, that all A, B, D, and E are all on the critical path, and C, task C, is not on the critical path. So now, let's do this with another set of random numbers, and not just the most likely. So let me set these all up to zero. And now we need to change our reference, because what we want to understand is for this particular simulation now that has a value of 2394 rather than 22, if I did a delta here, epsilon, does it change? So I'm going to take this and copy this down here. And we'll go through that process again.
Once again, C is not in the critical path. So now what do we want to do? We'd like to be able to automate this in a way that we could look at different random numbers, different simulations, and we could record changing a task duration by epsilon changes the value relative to that particular simulation. I've now expanded the model to run 10,000 simulations. And with 10,000 simulations, using the full range of the minimum to the maximum in a triangular distribution, so it's continuous, the completion time of this simulation, which is actually simulation one, is 23.94. And if I went to simulation two, is 23.55. I'll put it back to one. Now down here, it's calculated the probability that each of these tasks is on the critical path. And we can see that B is on the critical path almost 80%. Task C is on the critical path 20%. And so if we look at this diagram and think about it, since task D requires both B and C, the critical path is going to be through B or C. D will always be on the critical path, as will E and A. And that's what we're seeing here in these results. But how do we calculate these numbers? All right, this is where it's going to get a little detailed, and we have to open up the engine and see what's going on. SIPMath sets up a worksheet called PM Table. And I have run SIPMath using multiple experiments. And what does that mean? It's actually run 10,000 simulations. This goes down for 10,000. And it's run six different simulations. Simulation six is actually no epsilons. We can see that over here in that at six it says all. And epsilon is only added in when this variable here is equal to the task. So what happens here is in simulation six, where there is no epsilons, the base value for this simulation is 23.93. However, when I apply an epsilon to task A, it drops by 0.01. Same for task B but not for task C, and it does drop for task D and E. Therefore, we can take the difference between this base value and the value with the epsilon. This gives us a table saying for each one of these 10,000 simulations, which of these tasks is on the critical path. So here, the first two, you can see the critical path is A, B, D, and E. But when I get to simulation three, now C is on the critical path. Let's set this to three and go look at the, re see why that is. First of all, you'll notice that the, this 2263 is the 2263 here. We can see in this particular simulation that task C is longer than task B, and therefore C is on the critical path. Let's go to tap, let's go to four. Now B is longer than C, so B should be on the critical path. We'll go back and check that. So we can see we're back here. Here's another one. Here's Here's seven, so we'll go to seven. And once again, C is longer than B. While we're here, why don't we look at the S curve of this distribution? So we can see that the average is 22.3 with a range about 16 to uh, almost 30. So now, how do we calculate these probabilities? Well, 
we've calculated for 10,000 simulations how many times each of these tasks is on the critical path. Task A, if I add up all the ones here and divide by PM trials, which is the number of trials I have, which is uh, 10,000, it tells me it's on the critical path 100% of the time. Task B, however, if I add up all the ones, it's only on the critical path uh, roughly 80%, and task C 20%, and D and E are 100%. So by simply taking the difference here of what it is without any epsilons and what it is with the epsilon, I can say whether the element is on the critical path. This is complex, but this is actually very simple relative to what you might try to do for an uncertain network and calculating it in the traditional ways. As an addendum, what would happen if we eliminated the requirement for D to not start until B is completed? In other words, we eliminate this arrow here. We might think of this as a mitigation. So how might we easily do that? We can come down here and change this to, instead of being the maximum of D13 or 14, I'll just put a time zero here. Now, let's keep in mind what are the critical paths? It was 79.9 and 20.1. Okay. Then we're going to hit the enter key. It's going to recalculate. And now what we find is that task B is only 27.6. Task C is 72.4, and task D is no longer 100%. It's 72.4. And that's because now there's only two paths, one path coming this way and another path just going through here. So we can see how this critical path can be changed by just changing the network. Thank you for watching.